Hello, this is David Diga Hernandez, and you're watching Spirit Church here on the Encounter TV Network. I want to now continue my teaching on the Holy Spirit by talking to you about the language of the Holy Spirit. And by this, I mean the gift of speaking in tongues. We are going to dig deep into the Word of God on this topic. And I know that this spiritual gift will absolutely change your life. But first, Stephen Moctezuma is here with me. He's going to lead you in some very anointed worship. And then we're getting right into this teaching. Here is Stephen Moctezuma. Take us to deep, deep places where all we can see is you. Let us see open heaven with angels surrounding you. Here in the courts of heaven, we want to hear. Give us a revelation of all that you want to do. Let your glory fill this place. As I seek you face to Let your glory fill this place As I seek you face to face Let your glory fill this place As I seek you face to face, let your glory fill this place. As I seek you face to face. As I seek you face to So let's get right into this. I want to talk to you about this important gift and dispel some of the common misconceptions and even address some of the obstacles that keep you from receiving this gift. So the scripture, though it does not use the terms I am about to use, clearly teaches us that there are three expressions to the gift of speaking in tongues. So the first expression of the gift of speaking in tongues, I call the proof tongue. And this is found in Acts chapter 2. Verses 1 through 6, the Bible says, On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then, what looked like flames or tongues of fire, appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. All the believers were gathered together on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit moved. So what was it that was being spoken? It was a supernatural empowering that enabled the believers to speak in languages that they did not know. Now, this is interesting to me because the Bible shows us that every man who was there observing, each individual heard them, collectively the crowd, speaking in his own language. So if each individual 
is hearing the whole crowd speak in his own language, this demonstrates to me and helps me conclude that the gift of tongues in this specific portion of Scripture was actually supernaturally empowered on the hearer's end. This was a demonstration of God's power to the unbelievers. Acts chapter 2 verse 13 says, But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, They are just drunk, that's all. Some of the people there did not hear the believers speaking in their own languages, which is why they thought they were drunk. They likely heard them speaking in gibberish. So again, this demonstrates to us that the supernatural empowerment took place on the hearer's end. But either way, one of the expressions of the gift of speaking in tongues is this supernatural ability to speak in unknown earthly dialects. Whether it's on the speaker's end or on the hearer's end, this gift manifests power and again is a sign to unbelievers. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 22 says, So you see that speaking in tongues is a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. So that is the first expression of the gift of speaking in tongues. It's the proof tongue. It's that supernatural ability to speak in unknown languages that are earthly. But number two, the prophetic tongue we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning at verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, that all things be done unto edifying, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 26 through 28. So what is this expression of the gift of speaking in tongues? It's a gift that is used in a public setting. The prophetic expression of the gift of speaking in tongues commands the attention of believers assembled in a church service. So, how does this look? Well, the Bible says that everything is to be done unto edifying. So in a church service, if someone were to stand up and interrupt the entire service by praying in tongues, and the purpose is to edify the believers, then that tongue must be interpreted by the gift of interpretation. So let all things be done in an orderly manner. The Bible goes on to say, if there is no interpreter, it's out of order. But if there is no interpreter, that doesn't necessarily mean that it was the speaker's fault. It's possible that the Holy Spirit would move someone to stand and pray in tongues, and then the Holy Spirit moves someone to interpret, and the person who was supposed to interpret might not obey the voice of the Holy Spirit. So just because someone stands and prays in a tongue without interpretation, that doesn't necessarily mean that it was the fault of the one who obeyed the voice of the Holy Spirit to stand and speak in tongues. But still, Paul the Apostle is writing that there must be order, especially when it comes to this expression of the gift of speaking in tongues. But this is a different expression of the gift of speaking in tongues because it demands interpretation. Now we're going to read about the third expression of speaking in tongues, which is the personal. And again, you're not going to find this lingo or you're not going to find these terms in the Bible. Rather, you will see these expressions in the Bible, and I'm giving them terms so that they stand out more clearly. So number one, there's the proof tongue. That's where an unknown language is spoken that is earthly, and the hearer hears the individual praying in tongues, speaking in their own language. Number two is the prophetic tongue. This is that prophetic expression in a public assembly in a church service that actually is supposed to be accompanied by an interpretation. And then number three, there is the personal tongue. This is your prayer language. This is you edifying yourself through your own prayers. And indeed, that is a real thing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning at verse number one, the Bible says, Let love be your highest goal. But you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, watch this, you will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. Now, let's stop just there for a second. This right here is not an earthly dialect because people don't understand you. Nor is this a public expression of the gift. Well, how do you know it's different? I know it's different because you're edifying yourself because you're praying to God, because this is still counting as a prayer. This is not necessarily fruitless, but it is different than that prophetic expression, that public expression of the gift of speaking in tongues, since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit. So the Bible isn't saying that this is not of God. It's saying you will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, 
and comforts them. Now watch this verse 4. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. So first off, here are some obvious distinctions. Again, no man understands, therefore it cannot be that earthly dialect. Number two, you see in verse four that this person is edifying or strengthening themselves. So this differentiates it from the other two. The other one, the prophetic tongue, if it's not interpreted, has no fruit. This one, even if it's not interpreted, strengthens the individual. So there we see a very clear distinction between the prophetic expression of the gift and this personal expression of the gift, as well as from the proof expression of the gift because it's not an earthly language that's understood by anyone. So only the spiritual gift, this is the only spiritual gift used for self-edification. So what is this? It's communication from the Spirit. It's communication through the Spirit. I'm going to show you a verse in Romans chapter 8, and this verse is often misapplied, so I want to make sure that I'm careful to not do that. But let's go look at Romans chapter 8, verse 26. This is not talking about the gift of speaking in tongues, but it is related to the gift of speaking in tongues. And I'll explain that in a moment. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. So again, that verse is not talking about speaking in tongues, but it is talking about something deeper. It's talking about the Holy Spirit praying for you. Now, where do we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit? It's in the Spirit. Your Spirit communicates with God's Spirit. This is that inner oneness, that, 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 that fellowship with the Holy Spirit that's never broken in the believer. So the Holy Spirit within me prays for me. The Holy Spirit has desires for me. The Holy Spirit has expressions that He makes for me. He prays earnestly for me according to God's will. In other words, He is earnestly, passionately praying and pleading for me praying that I would be inclined to the will of God, that I would be bent toward the will of God, that I would be kept on track on the will of God. Those are powerful prayers by the Holy Spirit who helps to keep us from wandering off from the faith. You and I so easily are distracted and we have the tendency to wander. But the Holy Spirit within us is that compass, that inner guiding light that will constantly pull us back not in a weak way, but in a passionate, earnest way. He is praying and He's pulling and He's bringing you on track and fixing you in the will of God. That's the power of the prayer of the Holy Spirit. So again, that verse is not talking about speaking in tongues, but it is talking about the prayers of the Holy Spirit. Now the Bible says, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with Him. So my spirit is one with the Holy Spirit. Follow this now. My spirit is one with the Holy Spirit. It's very simple. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14 says this, For if I pray in tongues, watch this now, my spirit is praying. Wow, that's powerful. If I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. If my spirit is praying, who is guiding my spirit? Of course, it's the Holy Spirit. Therefore, when you pray in tongues, you are allowing the Holy Spirit to pray for you through you. When you pray in tongues, you are putting words, you're putting expression on those earnest prayers of the Holy Ghost. When you pray in tongues, you are coming into agreement with what the Holy Spirit is praying, and you are praying perfect prayers. So then, remember that we are one with the Spirit, so when we are praying in tongues, we are praying, in, we are praying the Spirit's prayers over ourselves. He's praying for us, through us. We're praying from, from the Spirit. Remember, body, soul, spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. I'm not praying from my body, not just words. I'm not praying from my soul, not just emotions. I'm praying from my Spirit. It's as if the Holy Spirit is praying, I'll pray for you myself if you would just give me a mouth. And when you pray in tongues, you give a mouth. And this isn't to say that He's not praying for you if you're not praying in tongues. But this is you coming into agreement, exercising your free will. By the way, free will is very important when it comes to prayer. Jesus said, when you pray, pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why do we have to pray for God's will to be done? Because He gave us charge over this earth. He gave us authority in this world. And He doesn't want to violate our free will. So when we pray in tongues, we are perfectly agreeing with the Holy Spirit. We are speaking the language of the Holy Spirit.
I feel like praying in tongues right now. This is getting me uh, worked up here. I, 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 I feel elated in the spirit just talking to you about this. So again, it's as if the Holy Spirit is saying, I'll pray for you myself if you'll just give me a mouth. There's a very popular story about a father who was teaching his little girl to pray. He wanted his daughter to learn how to pray at bedtime. So he taught her each night how to pray. They said their bedtime prayers and he would leave the room and she would go to bed. After a while, he decided to allow the little girl to pray on her own. And so he allowed her to pray her own bedtime prayers with him not present in the room. Then one night as he walked by his little girl's room, he decided to put his ear on the door and listen to her pray. She began to pray, or so he thought, but as he listened in more intently, he heard his little girl singing the alphabet. She wasn't praying words, she was saying A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And she was singing the alphabet over and over again. He thought this was cute, funny. He left it alone for that night. But as he began to pass by each night, he realized she's not changing. She's doing this every night. Maybe I should go in and say something. So finally, on the third night or so of this, the father walks into the little girl's room and he corrects her saying, listen, that's not how you pray. You can't just say the alphabet. You have to actually talk to God. And the little girl said, I am talking to God. I'm giving him the letters and I'm letting him rearrange them however he wants. I'm letting him make my prayers with the alphabet I give him. Now that's childlike faith. That's sincerity. And that is what praying in tongues is. You are surrendering syllables, sounds, um, the, the language of the Spirit is the language of faith and surrender. Why wouldn't the language of the Holy Spirit require faith to pray? When you pray with your understanding, you're attaching your meaning to your words. When I speak words as I'm talking to you right now, I'm attaching meaning to my words. It's always interesting to me how language works. As I'm talking, I'm saying words, you're hearing words, and you're understanding what my meaning is. I, I'm just saying words and I'm sending messages to your mind right now through your ears. That's incredible. But as I'm talking right now, every word I speak, I am adding my own intention to each word. I am adding my own meaning to each word. I'm adding my own idea, my own thought to each word. But when I pray in tongues, I pray words, syllables, and sounds that my mind does not understand. And therefore, I leave a void in those sounds. I remove my intention from my voice. I remove my intention from those sounds. I remove my will from my voice. I remove my desires from my voice. I remove any mixture I might have with the world from my voice. And I'm praying purely just sounds that have a void for the Holy Spirit to fill. I am praying surrendered sounds. I am praying surrendered syllables. Again, praying in tongues, the language of the Holy Spirit is the language of faith and surrender. You have to be childlike to pray it. When you offer Him syllables and sounds in faith, trust that He will attach His meaning. When I pray in tongues, void of my meaning and intention, now they're empty, and the Holy Spirit can fill them with His intentions, His meaning, His desires, His will. And that comes from deep within my spirit, praying in agreement with Him. So you can have the Holy Spirit and not pray in tongues. You can be saved and not pray in tongues. It's possible. You see, when you communicate with God in your language, you're communicating on your level. My daughter, as I teach this, is only nine months old. She makes sounds and she communicates with me as best she can. But one day when she learns my language, she's going to be able to communicate with me on a much higher level. Her and I will connect in a deeper way because she'll be able to use words and tell me what's going on inside of her mind. When you and I pray with our language, we can only communicate with God as far as our understanding will allow. But when you and I pray in tongues, we're praying according to God's understanding, according to God's will, and we rise to a higher level in the Spirit. So you can be a Christian and not pray in tongues. I don't believe that you're not saved if you don't pray in tongues. But my question to you is, why would you want anything less than all which Christ died to give you? Christ died to give you gifts. Christ died to give you salvation. If, if my connection with the Holy Spirit was purchased on that cross, I want the fullness of it. This is not a charismatic thing. This is not a Pentecostal thing. This is not a David Diga Hernandez thing or Encounter TV thing. 
This is a God thing, and God wants you to have this gift too. God wants you to experience this beautiful gift, which leads me to deal with now the misconceptions. The first one being, didn't Paul say that the gift wasn't for every believer? Let's take a look at that. That's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm going to read verses 29 and 30. The Bible says this, Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in tongues or unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. So shouldn't that settle it right there? Well, remember, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is specifically talking about that prophetic expression of the gift. Look, it says it right there. He says right after in verse 30, do we all have the ability to speak in tongues or unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages or, or tongues? So there you see the connection made. He's not talking about this self-edifying gift of speaking in tongues that requires no interpretation. He's talking about the public prophetic expression of the gift. So now every gift is listed that can be uh, in the Christian community. Think about this. You, you have here the question, are we all apostles? No, we're not all apostles, but can we all help to establish ministries? Of course. Are we all prophets? No, we're not all prophets, but can we all hear the voice of God? Of course. Are we all teachers? No, we're not all teachers, but should all of us be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is within us? Should all of us be prepared to teach the Word of God? Of course. Do we all have the power to do miracles? No, we don't. Not everyone has that gift of miracles, but doesn't every believer experience miracles in their life? Do we all have the gift of healing? No, we don't all have the gift of healing. But Mark chapter 16 says that they who believe will lay hands on the sick and they shall be whole. I mean, it's not specifying special believers. It's saying all who believe and lay hands on the sick will see the sick healed. So the same thing would apply here. So this is talking about the public expression of the gift of speaking in tongues. The gift of tongues that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12 is different from the one used for self-edification mentioned in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2. So one is for the edification of others. One is for the edification of self. Every gift listed here in 1 Corinthians 12 was used in Christian community. Every gift listed here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is used in public expression. It's used to edify others. So it couldn't possibly be talking about 1 Corinthians 14 too, which is used to edify yourself. Again, one is for the edification of others. One is for the edification of self. Also, on the day of Pentecost, remember when, when everyone saw the Holy Spirit fall and heard everyone speaking in tongues? This is what Peter says in Acts chapter 2, verse 39, that the gift was for all who have been called. Well, what was for all who have been called? He says so in Acts chapter 2, verse 33. He described it as just as you see and hear today. What were they hearing? They were hearing them pray in tongues. So that gift that they were hearing was for all who have been called. It's very clear in that portion of Scripture. So the self-edifying gift is for you. You may not have that public expression of the gift of speaking in tongues, and not everyone has all those gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12 because they're used in the context of church community. Now, didn't Paul the Apostle discourage people from praying in tongues, though? Well, let's take a look. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. We read this portion of Scripture, but let's take a look at it again. Let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. So here we see that he's emphasizing the gift of the prophetic. Verse 2, for if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit. Here he acknowledges, if you pray in tongues, that self-edifying expression of the gift of speaking in tongues, you're, you're speaking by the power of the Spirit. He says it very clearly. But it will all be mysterious. But, verse 3, one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, so he's not saying that's a bad thing. He says, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Paul the Apostle taught that prophecy was better, not that speaking in tongues was bad. He's comparing the gifts, not condemning the gift of speaking in tongues. Uh, you can go and read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 5. Actually, let me read it to you. 1 Corinthians 14, 5, I'm going to show you that he doesn't actually condemn the gift. He says here in 1 Corinthians 14, 5, I wish you could all speak in tongues, but even more, I wish that you could all prophesy. So he wants them all to speak in tongues, but again, he's saying prophecy is better, not that tongues is bad. So he says, I want you all to pray in tongues, 
but I, I more so want, I more so desire that you all prophesy. And then let's go down to verse 18, where the Bible says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 39, Paul the Apostle writes, So my dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and don't forbid speaking in tongues. So we see that speaking in tongues is actually encouraged. Now, wait a minute. Didn't Paul the Apostle say that we weren't to pray in tongues in public or we weren't to pray in tongues all at once? Well, let's take a look at the verse here, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. But remember, Paul the Apostle is talking about the public expression of the gift. He's regulating the prophetic expression of the gift of speaking in tongues. Now, here are some examples in the Bible of believers all praying in tongues together. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. You say, well, that's when the Holy Spirit fell and afterwards they regulated it. Well, look at this, Acts chapter 19, verse 6. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So all of them now are praying in tongues collectively together. Now, here we have to understand that Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians 14, once again, his goal was to bring order to the church. So if everybody is singing the same song in a church, that's not disorder, but everyone is singing at once. The same is true of praying in tongues. If you take a moment in a service and say, everyone just pray in the Holy Spirit just for a few minutes, everyone is collectively or in order praying in tongues together to pray that God would be allowed to move in that service. They're surrendering to the Holy Spirit together. Now, if somebody interrupts a sermon and starts praying in tongues, that's out of order. And that's what Paul the Apostle was correcting. People kept interrupting the service with their own agenda. They kept interrupting the sermons and the teachings. And the prophecy was standing and praying in tongues, distracting everyone, calling attention to themselves, and creating chaos in the church service. That's what Paul the Apostle was regulating. But if a group of believers wants to pray in tongues collectively, corporately, there's nothing that condemns that in the Scripture. So those verses me mention nothing about interpretation, Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and Acts chapter 19, verse 6. They mention nothing about somebody standing and interpreting. It was just that self-edifying expression of the gift of speaking in tongues. So I believe God wants to give you this gift. Now that we've cleared some of the misconceptions, now that we've taken a look at what this actually is, I hope and I pray that your desire for the gift has been kindled. So what are some of the obstacles to receiving this gift? Now, I've heard from people all over the world who've been very frustrated with not being able to receive the gift of speaking in tongues. They'll, they'll tell me, I've been prayed for dozens of times, nothing happened. I've been, I've been to every altar call, I've tried all these different ways, and it just never really clicked for me. I'm going to show you what the obstacles are, and my prayer is that after you hear this, you'll start praying in tongues, like right here, right now, in the next few minutes. That's my prayer for you. So let's take a look at some of the obstacles that really can grab hold of your mind and prevent you from receiving this gift. But though there are many obstacles, it all comes down to one thing, self, ego. By ego, I don't mean pride. By ego, I mean self. Every obstacle that would prevent you from speaking in tongues can be categorized under one thing, self. You're getting in your own way. So here are some of the obstacles that can be categorized under self. Uh, one is over analysis. Some are hesitant because of some fleshly actions they've seen other Christians act out. So for example, maybe you've seen people on YouTube who were praying in tongues and they just really acted disorderly or they were crawling all over the floor, floor barking like a dog. And it was just, it was not a pretty picture. It was not very edifying. It wasn't reverent. It wasn't holy. It wasn't regal. It wasn't gentle as the Holy Spirit is. And maybe this turned you off to the gift altogether. Let me tell you, just because you pray in tongues doesn't mean you have to swing on chandeliers and bark like a dog. The gift of praying in tongues is a heavenly language. It's a prayer language that God gives you to enhance your prayer language and strengthen your own spirit. And as the other expressions teach us, strengthen other people. But this over analysis, this, this overthinking, it really will prevent you and it will rob you from what God has for you. So some are hesitant because of what they've seen. Uh, some people are afraid of looking foolish, so their pride gets in the way. That's number two. Number three, they're afraid. They ask questions like, what if it's just me? What if it's demonic? What if this isn't God? Let me tell you something. Speaking in tongues at best is a prayer language from heaven. 
At worst, it's a sincere expression of your love for God. I, I think it's odd that people would say, well, it's a demon. Well, not really, because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 through 11, Or what man is there of you whom, if his son asks for a bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him? And in Matthew's gospel, that same narrative, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit. If you ask for the Holy Spirit, God's going to give you the Holy Spirit. He's not going to give you something else. So if you're standing there saying, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, and you start praying in tongues, that can't possibly be a demon because God would not send a demon to fill you. And in fact, if you're a believer, you can't be filled with the demon. So we have to be careful about allowing our fears to rob us of spiritual gifts that God wants to give to us. So you may say, well, what if this isn't God? And again, I want to emphasize, at best, it's a prayer language. At worst, it's just an expression. It would be along the same lines as crying tears. When you cry tears to the Lord, that's all emotion. That's a tear, but that's sincere. You're not edified by that. You're not understanding that tear. It's just an emotional expression that comes out of you. So at worst, the gift of speaking in tongues is an emotional expression of worship I don't see anything in the scripture that would indicate that it's a demon, especially if you're aiming it toward God, you're, you're, you're lifting it toward God. What, what could be wrong with lifting your voice and, and releasing sounds toward Him in love and in appreciation for His nature and who He is? How could that possibly be wrong? So again, at best, it's a prayer language. At worst, which I don't believe it's just this, but at worst, it's just an emotional expression aimed toward God. So we mustn't be afraid to step out in faith and receive this gift. And finally, number four, inaction. Speaking in tongues is like starting a car. You have to turn the key. But if you don't turn the key, that engine isn't going to start. When you drive your car, it isn't you making ste taking steps that drive that car forward. It's you pushing your, your foot on that gas pedal, and then the engine takes over and takes you places. So when you begin to pray in tongues, you have to turn that key. Once you turn the key, the engine or the Holy Spirit will take over, but you have to initiate it. It's in your control. Think about this. People say, well, I, I, I don't know if it's really under my control. Paul the Apostle spent a whole chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. The whole chapter is about how to regulate and control the gift. Now, why would Paul the Apostle write a whole chapter on how to regulate and control the gift if the gift couldn't be controlled and regulated? In fact, it can be controlled, it can be regulated. You can't just stand there, stare, at, stare blankly and expect the Holy Spirit to come. Listen, the Holy Spirit's not going to come, grab your tongue and start moving it up and down. You have to release the syllables. You have to release the sounds in faith. You have to stop overthinking it. You have to stop imagining that people will think you're foolish. You have to stop being afraid of receiving something else and you have to stop standing there inactive. Listen, I've talked to hundreds of people who had this point of frustration. And they say, I've been prayed for a dozen times and it's never worked for me. Even after hearing this teaching, I've had people tell me, I listened to your teaching and it didn't work for me. And I say, well, it all comes back to this. Even if you hear what I'm saying right now, that doesn't mean you're applying it. If you apply what I'm saying, you will be praying in tongues. There's no doubt. It's, it's guaranteed 100% because the Bible says if you ask, you receive, and then it's up to you to release it. But you have to speak it out. You have to pray. You have to start that engine. You have to turn that key. And you'll sense it. There's going to be a moment when you start praying in tongues, and then, and then the flesh will come, and you'll say, is this really God, or is this just me? Maybe God's going to get mad at me because I'm mimicking it. Whatever. Those thoughts all come to your mind. But remember, at worst, it's just an emotional expression toward God. But if you will start to express those sounds, you will sense a moment where the Holy Spirit will take over and it will start to flow naturally. And the more often you do it, the more naturally it will flow. So you have to stop overthinking it. You have to stop overanalyzing it. You have to stop creating these obstacles in your mind to receiving it. And you have to make those sounds, release those sounds, and you watch the Holy Spirit take over. Release the syllables and sounds and trust the Holy Spirit will add His meaning. No matter how many times it fails, no matter how many times it doesn't work for you, it's always going to come back to this. So if you write to me, if you comment or if you say something to me uh, you know, or email me and say, David, I tried it and it didn't work, I'm telling you, if you do this, it will work. And you say, if you say it doesn't work, it's because you're allowing one of these blockages to keep you from receiving that gift. So that's how confident, I know I've seen it work for thousands of people. Let's believe now that the Holy Spirit will fill you and that you will start to operate in this gift right now in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for that one receiving this now. 
And I ask you, Lord, to begin to give them the courage. Give them the unction. Let that gift rise within them from their spirit. And I pray, God, you would give them the boldness and the faith to begin to speak it out. Now, I want you, as you're listening to this, I want you to begin to speak it out. You may say, that's just me. You may say, oh, it's just a sound. You may say, this is silly. Stop letting that blockage take over. I want you right now, release it. Release it in the spirit. I'm not going to pray in tongues because I don't want you just to mimic me and I don't want that to be in your head either. I want you to just release that sound out. Don't, don't think about it. Stop analyzing it. Stop keeping yourself from doing it. Just go for it right now. And Father, I pray you add right now. Add the fire of the Holy Spirit. Begin to take over as they surrender those syllables and sounds. In the name of Jesus, we pray. I want you to say it because you believe it. Say amen. That is it for the lesson. If you spoke in tongues for the first time, I want you to comment on this video. Let me know you did. I want to welcome now the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. We love you. We're praying for you. I always say that because I always mean it. If you'd like information on how you can join the Spirit family, go to davidhernandezministries.com slash spiritchurch. You're going to get an email from me every single week with a brand new teaching and a brand new worship cover from Mr. Stephen Moctezuma. And now to your comments. And these comments come from my teaching from last week, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. If you haven't seen that yet, go and watch that. It's a precursor to this lesson and it will help lay a more solid foundation for your understanding when it comes to the language of the Holy Spirit. So go check that out. And while you're at it, be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share. I encourage you, support this ministry through sharing this video with at least three people. Text it to them, post it to them, whatever you have to do, just share it. And remember, subscribe and click that notification bell so that you can receive all of the content. Be sure to connect with us all across our social media platforms. And if you'd like me to potentially read your comment on next week's edition of Spirit Church, then go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section right now. But here are the teachings. Here are the comments from last week's teaching. Grace Point Meridian writes, Pastor David, I have been a Christian for almost 40 years. I have been in ministry for almost that long and a pastor for five years. I have never heard anyone explain body, soul, and spirit so well. I understand it better than ever before. Thank God for his anointing on you, Pastor Randall. Pastor Randall, I'm honored that you would, you would pay such an encouragement to me. And I know you know, sir, we give all glory to the Lord. But thank you for writing in. Bruce Mulenga writes, No one has ever taught the baptism of the Holy Spirit this clear. We thank God for you and your ministry. Yasmina Gustave writes, It's a pleasure learning and knowing more about the Holy Spirit. Your messages keep my heart desiring more of the Holy Spirit. Blessings. LB writes, Great job, Brother Hernandez. I'm so happy that this day and age we have a brother like you teaching the uncompromising doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We need churches all over this country to return to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's so, so needed. And I so agree with that. We need a return of the power of the Holy Spirit. Thankfully, he's moving here through this ministry, and I know he's moving through you too as you surrender to him. And the final comment comes from Gabriella David, who writes, I cannot tell you how much this video means to me. I wept and prayed for God to tell me what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and how I could experience it. I wept and I slept. This morning, I see this. I dare anyone to tell me this is a coincidence. Gabriella, this is no coincidence. That's the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. This is the Holy Spirit's channel. The Holy Spirit, the Father God gave me a very clear mandate. He said, I want you to introduce my Holy Spirit to your generation. And that has been the cry of my heart, that a generation of believers might come to know the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, also that unbelievers might come to know the gospel message of salvation. But I want to talk to you now about that. You see these comments, people's lives being impacted. And perhaps as you're watching this, you realize that your life has been impacted by this ministry too. The world as we know it is becoming darker. But that doesn't mean that we must stop preaching the gospel. We shouldn't throw up our hands and say, that's it, we're done, let's get out of here. There's no hope. So long as there are righteous in the land, there is hope for a nation. There is hope for this world. I want you to help me with something. I'm, I'm sincerely asking for your help. 
I want you to partner with me in doing something. I need you, together with other believers watching this, to partner with me and support this ministry financially. Everything this ministry does costs money. The videos we make, the books we produce, the events we put on, all of that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars and in fact is getting now to the millions. We need supporters like you to come stand alongside us and say, we believe the Jesus you preach. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit you preach. We believe in the messages you share. We believe in the power that you take around the world. And you want to join with me. You want to join with me. I'm asking you now, partner with me today. Become a supporter for $30 or more a month. Maybe you could do $10 a month. That would be awesome. Maybe you could do $5 a month. That would be awesome. But if you partner with me for $30 or more a month, I will send you one of these books as my free gift to you. It'll be an initiation gift, just, so I'm, just my way of saying thank you to you. Partner with me today. Help us make a difference. Look, we want to keep the content free. We want to keep our events free. And we want to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world in the power of the Holy Spirit. You can make a difference. It's not too late. The world is not finished. God is not done with America. God is not done with your nation. God is not done with this world. We have a mandate to do. If you don't preach the gospel, if you don't support the gospel, nobody will. So stand with me. Stand with the Lord. Let Him know you love Him through your giving and give to this ministry today that we might continue to take the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. Give today, right now. Go to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see a link appear at the end. Click that link. Click that link right now. Go to davidhernandezministries.com. Write this. Pause the video if you have to. Go, go outside. Make that gift. Do it as the Holy Spirit leads you. I know He's speaking to you. Let your heart be moved. Don't harden your heart. Allow God to use you in this way. Partner with me today or give a one-time gift to this ministry. Again, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. And that is it for this edition of Spirit Church here on the Encounter TV Network. I'm David Diga Hernandez, and remember until next time, nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell. Also, help us spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.